DNA, the blueprint of, to our fruit. Now, DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. And according to Richard J. Roberts, DNA is the master blueprint for life and constitutes the genetic material in all free living organisms and most viruses. Now, just to see what and where this is, and we call it the physical basis of the heredity that um, Tybos and Louisa and Sops has been talking about. Now, in our plants, the cell is the smallest unit of life. Within the cell, there's a nucleus. And in the nucleus, there's chromosomes, which carries the heredity factors, which is called genes. Now, the genes, like I said, is a unit of inheritance, and they are made up of DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid and the chemical material of which genes are composed. So you can see that there's many plant cells and even in humans there's been what we call um, um, cells that are looking a little bit different due to the cell walls that we have and the animal cells also look different. But basically the internal part is all their nucleus and so on. So then why do we call DNA the blueprint for life? Now it's found, like I said, in almost all living things. And it contains all the instructions needed for a living thing to grow and develop. And remember, this information is in each and every cell. And it's the same information that's in each and every cell. It's like a recipe book. If you want to bake a cake, you take your recipe book and you know what to do with that. So your nucleus is containing a million recipes for what you need this plant to, to do or to grow to or to look like. And it's also often called the molecule of life. So how does it work? And it's a very intricate thing. And people working with DNA has my utmost respect because it's a super difficult um, subject to work with. And obviously, as you will recognize, being so small, you work in a laboratory when you work with it. The breeders works outside in the field. And if we want to move into this deep level of the plant, we have to be in a laboratory. So again, just to show you, you are your nucleus. In the nucleus, you get a chromosome um, that when you unravel them, they are having two um, strands of, of um, or the double DNA helix with base pairs. Now, what is base pairs? Base pairs are basically um, nucleotides that are in, um, bedded on your strands. It's kept together with a sugar backbone. And that is where your information lies. So it's much more complicated than it's shown here. But it's just for information's sake that we can understand how it works. So we have what we call a codon. It, it, it exists of three nucleotides. And that then um, codes for a specific um, amino acid. And then lots of amino acids together forms a protein molecule. So you can see that it's very interesting. If you look at this table here, that's basically all the codes that all life are made of. It's just so um, all, um, awesome to see that, to know that this is everything you need to build something with in nature. And what makes it even more interesting is that you have maybe for glycine here at the right hand bottom, you've got four codes that can, um, three, um, four three level codes that can make that, that specific amino acid. And then a, a row of amino acids um, actually constitutes a gene. And that then gives you your attribute that you need. So that's basically just a deep dive into the genetics. It's very, very basic. Um, there you can see at the top there's the strand, and if it um, folds onto it, itself, it makes a chromosome. So, like I said, the DNA is long spin molecules made of nucleotides, and there are four different types of nucleotides, like you could see in the previous G and um, previous slide. It's um, there's just four of them that are used to make everything, um, and that makes these combinations. Okay. Now with um, there's a few fascinating facts with regards to, to your um, DNA that I just want to tell you about. It's just for interesting. It's, it's, it's actually fun facts. And that is that um, our red blood cells, like I said, all cells have the same information. So you can actually take one cell and grow an organism from that. It's totally potent. So it's got everything in there that makes you what you are. But bl red blood cells have no nuclear and no DNA. 
And the reason for this is that it is adapted to um, carry more oxygens in its molecules, and therefore it's made in in um, it's, yeah, it doesn't contain DNA. Um, then, if you would take um, a single cell and the DNA in a single cell and stretch it out, it would be over two meters long. Then also, um, if you would take all your DNA and stretch it from the earth to the sun and back, that's all the DNA in your, in your body, it would be, you could go there and back more than 600 times. What is also interesting about DNA, it makes up only about 3% of your DNA, and it's, all, it's basically the same for plants as well. So only 3% of all that DNA is actually what is causing your phenotype or the thing that you're looking at, that plant, that fruit to look like it looks. The rest we, we, we call nonsense DNA, and the researchers are still out there trying to find out what that DNA is actually doing. Then also when you want to, comp to find out whether you have a plant or a um, child that belongs to a specific um, father, that's what we call um, paternity testing because you know where the, 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 the child came from, you know who the mother was, but you have to now to take the DNA from the father, compare it to the child, match that up, and then you know where the, which one was then your pollinator or in the case of humans, the father. Now, interesting take also is that um, throughout evolution, humans have lost over 500 DNA codes. Also, what is interesting is that um, the DNA is essentially a storage molecule. It's your recipe book. And you don't want to take your recipe book out of, out of your kitchen and get it all messed up, and then it's all lost. So it stays there. It, it's stored. And it can't move out of the nucleus. The only thing that can move, move out of the nucleus is your uh, messenger RNA, which is actually basically a, um, a reverse of your DNA. And that then goes out and it is then used to make your proteins from. Okay, so what do we do with this DNA, the blueprint of our fruit? How do we use it? Why is it so important for us? Now, um, when we are breeding and everything, we first look, uh, observe the physical and biochemical characteristics because it's easy. You can eat it, you can smell it, you can taste it, you can measure it, um, and you can even do biochemical work in a lab to see what is all your constituents in that fruit. And then we can use that um, knowledge to choose our parents from because we probably, like um, Tabos has shown you, want to, com to combine two different attributes to form one. So you want to combine nice taste with nice color because the two cultivars that you have, the one has the taste but no color and the other one has the color but no taste. So you want to combine that. But understanding the, 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 the genetics, like Tabos has also shown you, the heritability or the DNA makeup of the parent helps us also to make better decisions on which parents to cross. So, for instance, if I have a fruit and um, I want to convey a specific trait and it's the, the DNA is not there, that, that genes are not in that, that specific cultivar, I will not be able to transfer it anywhere and it will not be um, shown in your fruit because it's not there. So, how do we know if a hidden characteristic is there? We can do it by using the DNA. So we can use the DNA to see whether the desired characteristics have been inherited by the progeny long before you can see it in the fruit. This helps a lot because you can see in many crops it takes about 10 years before you can see the first fruit. And then you've planted thousands and thousands of trees and you might have sort of made sure that you can only plant less of those, but being sure that the attribute is actually in that plant. We also investigate DNA to better understand different genes and the role that they play in the development of new fruit varieties. Like I said, we currently have the idea that only 3% of our DNA is, is used by, the, by a, an individual to, to get its attributes. So what's happening to the rest? So that's always being investigated still. Then we also take into consideration the desirable characteristics wanted by consumers and growers, and then try and see how we get it into a crop where there is no such attributes available. Okay, so like you have seen with, with what um, Louisa has presented and what Tybos has presented and even what the first talk was all about on the evolution of fruit, we eat with our eyes. We love color. We like our fruit to look nice. We like our fruit to be disease-free, no blemishes, 
no sting marks by insects. And we also like it to taste nice. We like it to have a flavor and we actually like it to smell like something. It's just so sad sometimes in the breeding of some flower species like roses, you have the most prettiest flower and you bend over to smell it and it absolutely smells like nothing. Because um, many times beautiful color and smell are not um, easily conveyed together. And then also the crispness, crispness of your fruit. You don't want them, um, a starchy, mealy type of fruit, and then it needs to be nice and firm and, and not being damaged easily. And then the newest attribute. One thing that people are looking into more and more now, like I told you, is the nutritional value. Not only do they want food that is um, not so sweet anymore so that it doesn't um, um, mess your diet, and they also, but they want to have extra vitamins. So vitamin C is a big one in your fruit, um, especially your um, citrus and your tomatoes. And then also your antioxidants in all your red and black fruits, like the blueberries and the strawberries. So that is all the attributes that are needed by the consumer. So then also characteristics that are um, sought after by the producers of um, obviously um, whether the selection are susceptible to, resist um, to diseases or resistant to the disease. And this is a very important one to look at at the DNA level because usually there's very few genes at play, so there can be a dominance or a, or a, um, um, that can play into this or a recessive gene that needs to be sought and um, could easily be found and then it makes the breeding much, much easier. It, we also want to know whether the yield will be better because the farmers need larger yields and also sometimes larger fruit, also sometimes maybe a smaller fruit, it depends on what the need of the consumers are. We also need to know whether fruits, uh, fruit trees will be able to survive and flourish in adverse conditions. And we used to thought of it as drought. These days, the new word is climate change. We want fruit that is resilient in an ever-changing um, climate. And then obviously to improve the quality, like we said. Okay, so in short, this is what DNA was. So what, um, to just to summarize, what do we use it for? We can use um, it for methods like fingerprinting. And like I said, we haven't even touched the whole thing about um, bringing in other genes and doing um, transformation. This is basically the tools that we use in our conventional breeding at this stage, but there's so much more to DNA that can be done. So what we do currently is we authenticize, um, we look at the authenticity of our plant material. So if they say it's a specific variety, is it really that variety? Um, we then also help ensure that growers are provided with the correct material from the, from the nurseries um, and that that material is stable and true to type. We also prevent the fraudulent commerce of plant material. People love to go into orchards and just pack a cutting and go make trees for themselves, but there's intellectual property involved in breeding and in genetical material. And you can't just go and cut any material and just propagate it because that belongs to somebody else. So with DNA, we can actually prove that that material doesn't belong to you and that there's an um, intellectual property um, against it and you need to pay a royalty for the material that you have. So um, that comes to the point where we say the rights of the plant breeders and licensees. So we can use the DNA fingerprinting to protect their, their, um, their property and the, the plant breeders' rights. We also use it in detecting genes associated with important traits. Like I said, we call that what's, what's, what's called marker-assisted breeding, where you can have a marker, for instance, for a nematode resistance or a marker for a blush on a pear. We also analyze the genetic variability. It's very interesting. With this, they could find out that for citrus, there was only three true species, the citron, the mandarin, and um, the shadows. And out of that, the lemon, out of the oranges, the lemons, and the grapefruits all um, evolved. So, um, and that was all done through a genetic DNA study. We also need to know the variability for crops like maize and wheat, where there's line breeding, and you sometimes lose a lot of your variability, and you end up with a, um, very few genes available for a trait that you need. Um, in our fruit material, we don't really have a problem with variability. Then we also search for potential, potentially useful materials. 
um, it could be like um, you can use it for uh, proteins that you want to, to um, produce, um, like medical um, attributes. And then we also can map the whole genome for specific traits, or we can do genome sequencing also to, to prove that this is a specific cultivar and in what order is all the genes. That's a very expensive process. So there's lots that can be done with DNA. Um, that, that researchers have already um, have the tools for. It's expensive tools. It's very difficult tools, and but it's exciting. It, and it, it, it's for people that love to stand in a laboratory. They don't like to be burned by the sun and get wet and dirty. Um, and it is a very, um, yeah, it, it, it's very fun to tell people what you're doing in the lab. It, it's it's really um, exciting for people to hear this because it's intricate. So again, you too can become a breeder. It is never boring. You can choose between the field and the laboratory. So contact if 